Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ryan Patel. I'm hosting uh, this webinar on measuring climate adaptation competencies, which is in support of the Climate Resilience Capacity Building Program. I'm also joined today by Patricia McQuarrie from the city of Camrose. Um, we'll be hearing from her later on in the webinar, but I did just want to start with a little bit of housekeeping as we get going. So we're hosting this webinar through Teams live, um, so you as an attendee are seeing a stream of the presentation, uh, which means your mic is muted and your cameras are turned off. If you do have a question or a comment, um, you can leave it in the uh, Q&A box. I'm just going to leave a comment there myself, so hopefully you can see that and be queued to um, leave your comment there. Feel free to drop them in there as we go, but we'll address them towards the end of the session. We are also recording today's session, so if you did want to go back and look at something, you'll have access to that shortly after the webinar. Um, and of course, if you have a question, you can always reach out directly. First, I acknowledge and recognize the land that I'm on. Today, I'm presenting virtually from the city of Edmonton. The lands on which Edmonton sits and the North Saskatchewan River that run through it have been the site of natural abundance, ceremony and culture, travel and rest, relationship building, making, and trading for Indigenous people since time immemorial. As mentioned, I'm joined by Patricia from the city of Camrose. Both Camrose and Edmonton are both located on Treaty 6 territory. We would like to acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries and whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant communities. For those that are perhaps not familiar with the Municipal Climate Change Action Center, we were established in 2009 as a collaborative initiative between Alberta municipalities, the rural municipalities of Alberta, as well as the government of Alberta. And the Action Center provides funding, technical assistance, and education to Alberta communities, nonprofits, and schools in addressing climate change. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, this webinar is in support of our Climate Resilience Capacity Building Program. I'm going to start with a few slides just on climate resilience, um, and then I'll jump to the climate adaptation competency framework and how this framework was used to develop our self assessment tool. Um, and as I mentioned, um, we have uh, the city of cameras here, so we'll do a live demo of the tool. We'll also do a bit of a preview into what cameras is doing as they are participating in the climate resilience capacity building program. And then towards the end, I'll just touch on the program, how it works, how you can apply for funding if you are interested. And as I mentioned, um, you can use that Q&A box uh, over hopefully towards the side of your screen to uh, ask questions as we go and we'll address them at the end and hopefully we'll get a chance to get to all of them. So we know that the Earth's climate is changing. Some of this change is due to natural variations that have been taking place for millions of years, but we also know that increasingly so, human activities that release heat trapping gases into our atmosphere are warming the planet at an accelerated rate. There have been significant commitments, significant innovation and action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but the current track that we're on, um, there's not enough being done and some degree of climate change is unavoidable and that's going to have significant economic, social, and environmental impacts. So we use the term climate resiliency uh, in reference to the capability to anticipate, prepare for, respond to, and recover from significant threats from climate change. And we look to increase climate resiliency as a way to minimize damage to social well-being, uh, the economy, and of course, the environment. Just some examples of primary biophysical impacts of climate. Um, these are some projections of rapid change uh, that are relevant to Canada and Canada's climate systems. Um, and these will, of course, have significant impacts in the physical way, but of course, they also have impacts um, to human health or the economy, like I mentioned. Some of the impacts that we're projected to see is permafrost thawing. Um, that, of course, has an impact on infrastructure in the northern part of the country. We're projected to see warming as well as prolonged droughts, which can increase the, the susceptibility to forest fires as well as insect infestations. 
We're expected to see increased drying of the continental interior, which can reduce snowpacks and shrinking of glaciers, um, which can correlate to water shortages for agriculture, human water supply, and other uses. We're also uh, projected to see increased frequency of heat waves and smog episodes, which can cause morbidity and mortality. Um, this is more notable in large cities where heat island effects can amplify these events. We're projected to see an increase of severity and frequency for some weather, some extreme weather events, as well as natural disasters, things like floods. Um, these, of course, have a large impact on economic activity, infrastructure, and health. And we're also projected to see increased damage to habitats for vulnerable species, which can impact local economies and traditional ways of life in some communities. Climate resilient strategies are therefore needed to reduce the harmful impacts of climate change and allow communities to thrive in the face of climate change. Um, generally, there's a way of looking at this sort of two sides. Uh, one is the proactive side, um, so actions including adjusting policies, plans, and actions uh, because of the expected changes in climate or the anticipated impacts that we might see. And then the other side of the coin are the reactive actions, and these generally occur in response to climate impacts. I think emergency response is probably a really good example in this case. Both are important, um, but in many circumstances, um, being proactive, anticipating actions um, that will help result in lower long term costs and be a bit more effective than reacting. And it's proactive planning and the capacity building that the capacity building that's needed around it. That is the focus of our funding program, the climate resilience capacity building program. So with that bit of context, we'll move into the climate adaptation competency framework. We um, use this competency framework to help develop our community self-assessment tool. The purpose of the tool is to help the communities assess their internal capacity on climate resiliency, as well as provide insights into which opportunities through the program are best uh, suited for their needs. Um, the framework itself is part of the Adaptation Learning Network project, which is funded by Natural Resources Canada, the BC Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy, as well as Royal Roads University. And this framework illustrates the different range of competencies that are needed to deal with and prepare for climate change, uh, both currently and in the future. Uh, it details these competencies that are required by uh, a single person that's working as an adaptation specialist or perhaps in a related field that's connected to climate. Um, and we use these individual competencies and scale them up into the skills and expertise that are needed uh, within a community, both for administration as well as for leadership uh, at, when they work on climate resilience projects. So we'll look at the framework first and then the tool uh, to kind of show that connection. We use the term competency or the, I guess the framework uses the term competency to refer to the specific knowledge, skills and behaviors that contribute to a specific performance. Um, and then these specific performances are grouped into five broad competency domains. And we'll look at all five in more detail. Um, but th they are just to kind of go over them together are climate adaptation science and practice literacy, climate adaptation leadership, working together in climate adaptation, understanding the climate adaptation challenge, and climate adaptation planning and implementation. So the first competency domain, um, like I mentioned, is science and practice literacy. Climate adaptation does require a foundation of knowledge or literacy in a number of different scientific areas, as well as having different worldviews and perspectives on this work. Uh, this includes understanding and being able to consider, bridge and apply knowledge from more Western climate change science and climate models, as well as more traditional or indigenous knowledge systems. It also requires understanding and the ability to apply systems thinking and climate change science to a range of issues and opportunities. So these were the four specific competencies in this domain, and we used all four to help inform our community self-assessment tool. Next we have 
climate change leadership competency as, as the so we have climate change leadership as next competency domain. Uh, in this context, we know that effective leadership um, for climate adaptation should be adaptive, it should be flexible, it should be emotionally intelligent as well as culturally informed. Uh, the orientation to leadership recognizes the need to collaborate and cooperate among stakeholders, um, diverse stakeholders, diverse right holders, and it's guided by principles and practices of culturally appropriate engagement, reconciliation, change management, and adaptive decision making processes. So we found that all four of these specific competencies scaled well up into the community self assessment tool. Keep going here to the third domain, which is working together on climate adaptation. Uh, the framework outlines how problem solving in the context of a complicated problem like climate change um, should be collaborative. It should rely on insights and wisdoms from multiple right holders and stakeholders, and it should um, be generative, culturally safe, and there should be space for learning. Um, working in this space also requires strong science communication skills, both for indigenous and Western science worldviews, and the ability to engage diverse parties and to foster a sense of commitment and ownership of the problem that does translate into a shared understanding and action. So here there were five competencies in this domain, um, and we used four of them to inform the self-assessment tool. The next domain is understanding the challenge. Um, similar to the last domain, um, it's important to understand the challenge and that requires an orientation to problem solving that's grounded in understanding what we don't know. So what is uncertain, what is unpredictable, and that's very true for the complex world of climate change as well as the impacts of climate change on kind of the human side of it as well as the ecological side of it. So it's important to have an approach that understands that there is no right answer. There's no single def definite solution, um, but we have a range of solutions and some of those solutions are better, some are worse, some are more adaptive, some are less adaptive, and those all also have trade offs when it comes to other lenses. Uh, a good example might be comparing an actions um, adaptation benefit to its mitigation benefit. Um, but each solution um, may result in um, sometimes um, new or, or often unanticipated consequences. And it's working with this kind of complexity that requires a systematic analysis, a holistic analysis of the risks and impacts for both the problems and the solutions. We want to make sure we're assessing who or, or what um, is the most vulnerable or who will be the most vulnerable and iterating and learning from the measures that are implemented. This also includes considering the emotional and psychological consequence of climate change on individuals as well as communities and organizations and finding ways to maintain that personal or collective well-being in the space. So we found that four of the five competencies scaled well into uh, community self-assessment. The fifth competency domain um, is about planning and implementation. Again, similar to um, the previous one, uh, we know that generating and implementing climate adaptation measures relies that systematic approach. Um, we have to be inclusive, we have to be holistic, and it should be guided by an appreciation of uh, the outcome, the, the goal of maximizing long-term social and ecological resilience um, in the context of biodiversity and economy, financial variability, and um, the big thing is mainstreaming adaptation, kind of creating a practice of this work. Uh, the framework also states that climate adaptation planning and implementation requires being responsive to recognize policies, standards, regulations, and agreements, as well as applying a collaborative and outcomes-based approach to support iterative and ongoing learning uh, of ideas and strategies that are based on having some sort of systematic monitoring and evaluation system. So uh, this area had um, more competencies than the other four, but we did use five of the six to help inform uh, the community scale of what we think fits. 
So this sort of translates well from the framework now into how the tool works. I, again, the, the tool is built to help communities assess their internal climate resilience capacity. Of course, it's difficult for one person to assess this for a whole community, um, but the purpose is to sort of have somewhere to start and kind of build out from there. And the tool also does provide insights into which opportunities that are offered through the Climate Resilience Capacity Building Program are best suited to meet uh, the needs based on that assessment. Um, I'll always refer anyone back to the competency framework if you're interested in learning about um, the specific uh, skills and competencies, um, but you can use this tool just to help kind of gauge a general state of readiness. So in our tool um, for each aspect of climate resilience, um, we'll ask you to score uh, that competency from zero to four, um, and those numerical scores have kind of a corresponding state of readiness um, as well as sort of the the answer to the question my community is or my community has um, X in that context. And we'll look at this when we do the demo of the tool, um, but I just want to sort of flag that the total school, the total score uh, will be provided. Uh, it provides an assessment of your overall state of readiness and that gives you, uh, the total score gives you that information about finding supports. Um, however, if you have scores in subcategories or even for specific competencies that are perhaps different from your general trend of scores, um, that may help point to gaps um, that you might want to address. So just for example, if you know we scored zero in the working together competency domain and we had twos and all the other domains, um, that should be a flag that we need to do more work uh, in the context of working together. Uh, and again, please refer back to that competency framework for additional details on specific subcategories that may be of interest to you. So we'll look at um, the five domains again and kind of how the questions are awarded in the context for our community. Um, so the first question is just, does your community understand climate change and the associated impacts? Does the community understand climate resilience science? Does it understand indigenous experiences and perspectives on the environment? And does your community apply evidence and lessons learned from both indigenous and Western science and knowledge systems? And again, you would kind of score it from zero to four, um, zero being no experience, four being that you already do this work and you're ready to build upon existing experiences. In the domain of leadership, the questions are framed around the ability to address climate change in practice, uh, process on climate change objectives, as well as use a systematic approach to action on climate change, on climate resilience. And we also want to flag if leadership uses evidence-based decision-making in support of climate adaptation. So you may score this you know, one if you do it at a very basic level, or if it's integrated into the work that you do, you might do two or three. Uh, the third domain, working together, the questions are framed around, do, does the community communicate to shape climate resilience understanding and support actions? Um, this might be to residents, it might be to targeted stakeholders, can kind of let you decide. Um, does the community value diverse perspectives on climate resilience actions and outcomes? Does the community hold space for conversation about climate resilience? And does the community engage other stakeholders, industry, or cross-sector partners in climate resilience action? In the fourth domain, the questions are framed around, does the community understand local climate vulnerabilities and impacts? Does the community apply risk management? to climate impacts? Does the community look to short-term and long-term responses? And does the community apply financial and economic concepts to climate resilient actions? And then, like we mentioned, the fourth and fifth domains are well connected, um, but in the fifth domain, the questions are framed around, does the community have strategies, initiatives, and plans for climate resilience? Does the community consider climate resilience in, pol in policies and in governance? Does the community develop a capacity for staff as well as decision makers to be informed on climate resilience? Does the community apply project management principles 
to achieve plans and actions? And finally, does the community integrate and mainstream climate resilience considerations into decision making? And again, you would score it from uh, either zero, one, two, three, or four based on the state of readiness. Once you complete the tool, you'll see something like the left here, the results breakdown. You'll see sub scores for each of the five domains that we looked at, as well as a total score. The total score then correlates into this table um, on giving you a general state of community readiness that ranges from general awareness, basic skills, um, skilled in, in community readiness or expert. And then based on that, um, we would point you to specific program supports. Um, there's a handful of supports that are on the table here. Um, they are just suggestions or, or I guess just recommendations, not requirements. So, you know, if you have a high score, that's not to say you can't do X supports. Um, but I think this will become a bit more evident when we look at the live demo. So with that, my guest for today's webinar is Patricia McCrory from the City of Camrose. Um, as general manager for community development at the City of Camrose, Patricia is responsible for communications, economic development, planning and planning and development, and corporate business planning. Uh, Patricia has been with the City of Camrose since 2019. Um, prior to which she served eight years as counselor for the city of Atascawin. So thanks, Patricia, for joining uh, us today. Um, I'm just going to pull your video up so everyone can see you um, and we'll can get started. Hello, everyone. So thanks, Ronak. Um, the city of Camrose, for those of you that don't know, is lo located about an hour, um, hour and a bit southeast of Edmonton. So we're a population of, of close to 19,000 and we have 9,000 properties on our assessment roll. So I thought it would be a good idea for people to understand um, the level of infrastructure that we're kind of talking about when we're talking about our infrastructure. So we've got uh, 2.5 billion in infrastructure assets across the city, including uh, 2.14 billion in residential, 1 million in farmland, 622 million in non-residential, and about 72 million in machinery and equipment. So heavy load of assets, that we need to be cognizant of when we're talking about the effects of climate change in relationship to our projects. And I think uh, Ronak's going to run us through the tool. Yeah, so we're going to pop out of the PowerPoint and we're going to go over to um, the web page. So this is the homepage for the Municipal Climate Change Action Center. Um, you can find the tool under the program details. So this is in the Climate Resilience Capacity Building Program. Um, and there's a link to it here just in the sidebar. Um, of course, this is a bit of a demo of how the tool works. Um, we, Patricia and I both are pretty familiar with the tool, um, but I'll encourage, if you're looking at it for the first time, I'd encourage you to kind of read through the instructions. Um, they're fairly similar to what we talked about initially in, in, my, in my slides. Um, there's also a link to the framework, so um, you can see that uh, there as well. Um, like I mentioned, it kind of describes how to work through the framework, uh, the tool, sorry, and how the scoring works. Um, so again, you'll score things kind of answering the question, my community has and my community is, um, you know, no experience, has a very basic understanding, is planning or ready to plan, is ready to implement or ready to build upon existing experiences, and those all correlate to a score. So why don't we start the assessment here for cameras, Patricia? Sounds good. And I just like to mention that uh, I'm scoring based on my lens of this community, uh, and I know that there might be more competencies, say, in infrastructure that they're. So I'm scoring it based on my lens of what our community's at. Yeah, for sure. That's that's important. Uh, again, it's hard for you know, a single person to assess mm -hmm. the whole context for a community, but you can do your best. Um, there also might be value in you know maybe sitting down together with a, a few folks, um, a few different decision makers, and maybe doing it together. But um, we'll kind of just start the example here. So there's a table at the top that again explains the scores as well as here. But the first domain is literacy and practice. So for Camrose. 
Um, what would we say about uh, Cameron's understanding of climate change and the associated impacts? Two. Two, so yeah, planning or ready to plan. How about understanding climate science, resilience science? My degree's in art, so I'm going to say one. <laughs> Um, understanding Indigenous experience and perspectives on the environment. I'm going to say zero. We haven't engaged with our Indigenous community on that. Yeah, and, and this just to pause quickly, I guess um, this might be a good example of, you know, we're scoring something zero and that might tell us that, hey, this might be something we need to prioritize. Um, but yeah, we'll keep going. Um, the last specific competency is how does CAMROS apply evidence and lessons learned from Indigenous and Western science and knowledge systems. One. Um, so with this section done, we'll just click next and it'll take us into the next section around leadership. And you can see that we'll work through all the domains before we get to kind of the results. Um, so in the context of res climate resiliency, um, how does CAMROS address climate change in practice? Two. How does CAMROS progress on climate resilience objectives? One. How does CAMROS use, or does CAMROS, I guess, use a systematic approach to action on climate resilience? Uh, two. And finally, does CAMROS use evidence-based decision-making in support of climate adaptation? Uh, two. Sure. Um, then we'll move on to working together. Um, so, in the context of, again, of climate resiliency, how does CAMROS communicate to shape climate resilience understanding and support action? Two. How does CAMROS value, or does CAMROS value diverse perspectives on climate resilience actions and outcomes? Two. Does CAMROS hold space for a conversation about climate resilience? Three. So three is ready to implement. Yeah. Um, how does CAMROS engage with stakeholders? Um, that might be people in the community, that might be industry or other partners around climate resiliency. Uh, let's say two. Sure. The next domain, um, of course, is understanding the challenge. Um, so I guess how well does CAMROS understand local climate vulnerabilities and impacts? Two. How well does CAMROS apply risk management to climate impacts? Two. How well does CAMROS look at short-term and long-term risks and responses? Two. And how well does CAMROS apply financial and economic concepts to climate resilience actions? Two. Sure, so that one seemed like we're kind of at a good state of uh, planning or ready to plan. And and I will just say that I'm saying that we're at the ready plan, planning ready to plan stage because we've just started our climate <laughs> action plan. So of course in other sectors we're planning much, our numbers are much better. <laughs> Directly yeah. related to climate for the resiliency. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we're doing this in the context knowing that uh, yeah. Cameron's is working on a project, so um, that's important to keep in mind. Um, I guess I'll also say like it's not really like a, a test. You know, we're we're trying to score and be accurate as possible. Um, and the score that we get is the score that we get, and the intent is to build upon it. So even if you put four for everything, uh, the intent is that you can still build upon something. Um, but yeah, finally, in in the last section, we're talking about planning and implementation. Um, so, uh, does CAMRO, or I guess, yeah, in, in the state of readiness, does CAMROs have strategies, initiative, and plans for climate resilience? Two. Uh, how about applies project management principles to achieve plans and actions? Three. And that, yeah, that again is in, the, in this context of this work. So let's say two in this context, because oh. it'll come out of our plan. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the next one is consider climate resiliency in policy and in governance. Two. Uh, how about develop capacity for staff and decision makers to be informed on climate resilience? Three. And then the last one is how well is climate resiliency integrated and mainstreamed to cons into considerations for decision making? Two. All right, so we've 
gone through all five domains, um, we can hit next and what we'll get is uh, the general score. So like I mentioned, we'll see scores in kind of each of the domains. Um, it's a bit tricky to kind of compare them just because the planning and implementation domain does have more um, competencies, um, but we see that we know we have some lower scores that maybe we can focus on improving and some higher scores that might show us where our strengths already are. Um, but yeah, this gives cameras at least in you know, this version that we did um, a total score of 39 and that moves over here into the general state of readiness of basic. So we would say kind of generally that cameras understands the core aspects of climate resilience and adaptation. Um, so that's great. And then to connect it with our program, we would point you to a couple different um, supports. Um, and these might you know, change over time, but um, one of them is to complete the climate risk assessment and plan with funding support from the planning stream, which I think is transition back to the PowerPoint. So let's go over there. All right. So I'm, I'm glad the assessment showed that we should complete the risk assessment and plan with funding support from the program because that's exactly what we're doing. Um, and I should also mention, it, uh, Ronick didn't highlight this one specifically, but we're also sitting on the um, climate resiliency communities of practice through the MCCAC. And uh, that's going to be really valuable to us to hear what other communities are doing as well. So thanks for the opportunity for that as well. Um, so yeah, we applied for this uh, um, program, our community um, vulnerability risk assessment um, through the planning stream of the capacity building program. Um, we wanted to identify the, like you saw the, the billions that we have in assets. So we wanted to identify what the climate risks were related to those assets um, and then get the recommended next steps. So we could start getting further along the process of action planning and um, putting into place the long-term strategic actions that we would need to be resilient to climate change. So that's what we went, um, went to uh, RODAC with and said, this is the kind of program we wanna, we wanna run. And um, so if you go to the next slide there, I thought it would be useful to the other communities to run through kind of what that process sort of looked like for us. So in the grant application process, there's the um, requirement to have a, a quote from your contractor in place. So uh, what we did is we had the initial, initial meeting with RONAC to run through what we thought um, our program would look like. So we chose to do a very, um, infrastructure-based vulnerability risk assessment. Um, we got the kind of green light to say, yeah, that sounds like it, it fits into the program. So we issued an RFP um, with the support of information we got from the city of Lethbridge. Um, we issued the RFP, we chose a contractor conditional on receiving the grant. Then we submitted the application to the program using the um, RFP submission from the proponent and uh, was awarded the grant and then we entered into the contract with the um, the firm that's going to be leading up this project. So uh, a little bit different than some other grants that we've had in the past where you, you need that hard kind of um, quote going in, but the, uh, the submissions we received from the RFP understood the process and were aware of the process and it made sense to them as well. So, and it was a pretty seamless transition through that process. So uh, next slide there, um, yeah. so, oh, go ahead. Sorry, just to quickly interject. Um, thanks for sharing kind of your process. Um, the intent of the program is to be as flexible as possible. And part of that is recognizing you know, what procurement processes might exist for different communities. So um, there is a bit of room in here. Um, I'm not saying all of them have to kind of go through an RFP, but um, I think if someone has questions about that, we can connect on, it'll vary from a project to project basis. But yeah, thanks, Prisha. We'll keep going. Yeah, good addition there. That was because our procurement policy required that um, that RFP process. So other communities might be different. You're absolutely correct. Um, so like I said, help with help from the city of Lethbridge, uh, we looked at their model for their community vulnerability risk assessment and uh, pre uh, prepared our RFP based off that. And, and um, they were using the public infrastructure engineering vulnerability tool uh, for their, and we, we thought that fit really well into um, the categorization and the matrixing that we were looking for to evaluate our assets. Um, that process made sense to us. So um, that assessment really looks at the characterizations of all of your different assets 
put them into a, a scenario um, related to a variety of different climate vulnerabilities and then at the end comes out with an analysis of the highest um, priority items to be actioned and, and goes down a list from there. So um, that's the PIVEC model and that's why we chose that model. Next slide. So um, I don't, I think I say this in a later slide, but we ended up with um, a grant for $68,800 from the MCCAC through this program and uh, to support our community risk of vulnerability assessment. Um, which examines risks related to all of our municipal infrastructure, so stormwater, wastewater, waste management, fleet, etc. Um, as well as we also are looking at the social and economic consequences at a qualitative level, so not, not how many people will go to the hospital, but maybe that people will go to the hospital if uh, there's a heat wave, for example. Um, so the qualitative impacts for uh, climate change as well. It was really important to go back to that personal collective well-being for the city to make sure that we're examining not only the physical infrastructure, but also the effects on our, our citizens. We are um, looking at, yep, go ahead, sorry. We're looking at um, extreme rainfall and flooding, snowfall and snowpack and extreme cold, of course, extreme wind, heat waves, drought and wildfire as the key climate risks um, to our asset categories. And then we're time framing that over what's the risk today, what does the risk look like it's going to be in 2050, and what does the risk look like it's going to be in 2080 based on the current climate science that's available um, to us. So this, um, like I say that I lead this project, but really the heavy workload is coming from our infrastructure. So our GM of infrastructure is Chris Johnson and his team are very heavily involved in this project. They're driving the majority of the work of this project. And then our uh, GM of community um, services, uh, Ryan Poole and his facilities team on, on the facility side. So this really is a, a a multi-department approach to this project. Um, it involves a lot of city staff time and city involvement, but we felt that um, by involving staff throughout this process, we would get a tool at the end that they would understand and would be able to implement the actions with that understanding that was built throughout the process of this project. Um, so we're doing eight to 10 workshops with a variety of different staff um, identifying where the what the assets are, what services might be vulnerable, what what we've seen as already vulnerable, and what we might be anticipating in the future, identifying the social and economic consequences, like I said, and then de determining the risk over that time frame. And the outcome of all of that work from the staff will be the contractor coming back with a matrix that scores the highest risks to our infrastructure and then provides us with potential ad adaptation measures that we can will we can implement over time to build our resiliency across the community for um, climate change. So, um, so despite what our, our tool matrix, um, the, the tool that we just ran through says we Camrose has been punching above its weight in green initiatives. We have a green action committee um, that's been driving a lot of projects and we have things like solar panels on our rec facilities and we're contemplating those things going along, but it's not part of a, a larger program. And so this is our start at um, building this asset program directly related to climate change for the city of Camrose. Um, it, we are also starting an overarching asset management program and the work that we're doing in this risk vulnerability assessment is really informing that asset management. It's helping us gather all that data in the beginning, but then we'll continue to inform our asset management program as we go forward. Um, this program also allows us to have a better understanding of the risks and planning for those risks in the future. Instead of emergency repairs, we're knowing that this, this roof might have a vulnerability to extreme winds and start changing how we're designing our roof systems, for example. And then also looking at our social populations and identifying just the beginning work of identifying the vulnerable populations and the, the effects that they might see related to climate change and starting that social planning aspect of it. So this is really, um, this program is really the ground floor work of a lot of different work that we're going to be doing across the city in the next 10 to 20 years. And I'm happy to talk about how we went through our process and what our process looked like and what we're expecting and what our RFP looked like to any communities that are interested.
Yeah, thanks, Patricia. It's really valuable to have you sort of share this, um, especially because you're just starting a project. So um, maybe we can, you know, if it's a webinar as a follow up or even just a case study, we can commit to kind of communicating what you what you do find out or at least how you found out what you wanted to know. Um, but I really appreciate having you here. Um, maybe I'll just cover a couple of slides and then we'll see if there's questions at the end. Um, but yeah, thanks a lot for kind of talking about um, the project, and of course, the, the demo. Thanks for having us. OK, so I think there's probably a couple of folks here that are maybe hearing about the program for the first time or maybe need a refresher. So I'll just cover a couple of slides here. Uh, well, I think you can probably imagine um, based on what we looked at today already um, what the focus of the program is, but our intent here is to help all Alberta municipalities as well as Indigenous communities within the province of Alberta to better understand, cope, manage and adjust to changing climate conditions. Um, generally, we're looking to broaden literacy around climate resiliency. We're hoping that communities can assess their climate vulnerabilities or even opportunities if they exist. Um, we're hoping that communities can build plans and progress on risk reduction strategies. We talked about um, the planning stream mainly, but there are three funding streams that are offered in this program, each of which has a specific specific objective or participation criteria. Um, so the planning stream provides funding for the assessment of climate risks and vulnerabilities, um, as well as the creation of a climate resilience plan. The example from Camrose is a great example, but there are you know, other ways of doing this work, whether that be other processes. You don't have to just do uh, PIVC. You can use a different process um, or you could you know, look at different themes, different sectors. Um, there's some room for flexibility there to focus on um, what communities need to focus on. For those folks that might already have a plan, I would probably point you to the strategies and initiative stream. So here funding is provided for work that um, research and assessments um, looking at the feasibility of different measures that are already within a plan um, really just aiming to prepare actions for implementation and then we also have the indigenous climate resilience stream um, funding is provided here to indigenous communities for projects that increase community capacity on climate resilience and we're recognizing that there are unique perspectives unique impacts unique needs um, specific to the indigenous lens and we welcome projects that use indigenous and or traditional ecological knowledge. Um, who can participate? Um, so the following communities are eligible to participate in the program. Um, if you are a designated municipality within the province of Alberta, there are I think four different definitions under the MGA. Um, and then we also have uh, seven different types of, uh, or I guess, definitions of Indigenous communities. So, you know, First Nations within Treaties 8, Treaty 7, and Treaty 6, um, other nations, tribal councils, um, groups of nations, um, Métis settlements, Métis Southern General Council, Métis Nation of Alberta, self governing Métis nations, or non status Indigenous nations and communities. So, uh, all community types are open to apply to the planning stream and the strategies and initiative stream, but only the defined indigenous communities can apply to the indigenous climate resilience stream. But yeah, if you have a question about how the streams work, you can always reach out to me. Um, generally for all of the streams, the Action Center will provide funding covering up to 100% of pre-GSC capacity building services to a maximum funding cap of $80,000 per project per community. So all project types are subject to that same maximum funding cap. Um, there are a couple of different eligible costs. Um, they include the services of a qualified third party con contractor. Um, so you can bring someone in to do this work for you. Um, there are also a handful of costs related to the development of internal capacity. So that could include, but is not limited to knowledge transfer, workshops, training, internal contractors, wage subsidies and honorariums. And then for the Indigenous Climate Resilience Stream, um, we also allow for up to 15% of funding to be covered um, for to admin costs. We also, the second point here, we also do uh, welcome communities forming partnerships or working with an umbrella organization to receive funding. So that might be regional, maybe you choose to do a project with your neighbors. That might be cultural or governance or organization based. And those projects would be subject to a maximum funding of $160,000 per project. 
And then we also have a total funding cap. So um, you're welcome to apply multiple times, but we'll cap a single community at $160,000 across all the streams. And the last point I wanted to hit on is just that the approval and allocations of funds for eligible projects does occur on a first come first serve basis. There are a few deadlines. I'll talk about those, but um, funding is first come first serve. So um, just quickly before we get to questions here, um, how to participate in the program. Um, so step one is to review the program materials. I'd recommend that you look at everything in detail. There's the program guidebook, which really specifies how this uh, program works. You can also get in touch with me if you have any questions. Um, step two is to submit an expression of interest. Um, so the EOI is just a quick online form that asks you to share some high level information about your community and the need for support and how your project helps with that. Um, so you know what challenges are you facing? How does the program help you overcome those challenges? There's also a question about your current level of internal capacity. So here's a good chance to use that self assessment tool. Tell us how you kind of scored on that. Um, not mandatory to do the tool, but I would recommend it. Um, after you submit an EOI, um, someone from the Action Center will connect with you within 10 business days. Um, we'll talk with you just to confirm that your project is eligible. We'll discuss the needs that you have, answer any questions, and prepare you for that formal application stage. Um, so after that EOI submission and follow-up conversation, um, eligible communities can complete a program application. Um, the form is up on our program web, web page. It asks for several details. Um, we talked about some with cameras there, but um, basically we're looking for a full description of the work that will be involved with the, the grant proceeds that you're receiving. I also welcome communities to discuss the application with the Action Center in advance of finalizing the submission. So if you want to submit a draft application, we can definitely give feedback there. But when applications are uh, received, um, they'll be looked at um, within 10 days. Um, we will accept applications until March 31st in 2023 or until all the funding is allocated, whichever occurs first. Um, just again, want to flag that the completion of an application does not secure funding in that first come first serve queue. Um, that happens in the next step, which is um, step five. So if your application is successful, the Action Center will issue you a funding agreement. Alberta municipalities will be the signing body for all funding agreements. And all project work um, must be kind of outlined in the funding agreement. We'll probably use the application uh, and the attachments there to kind of go with that. <clears throat> And it's once the funding agreement is executed by both the community and Alberta municipalities, funding is allocated at that point. Um, and then shortly after that, we will release the first payment. Um, so the payment schedule for this grant program is in two parts. Um, so up front, when we sign the funding agreement, you'll get 75% of the total funding. Um, and then step six is kind of back to the community to complete the project. Once you're done, please submit the materials that were previously agreed upon in the application form for verification. Um, another deadline here is that all projects must be completed on or before March 31st in 2024. And once we verify that your project is complete, we will release the remaining balance that lasts 25% of funding. So that's just a quick overview of how the program works. Um, please do reach out if you have questions. Um, I think now maybe we can do a couple of questions. Uh, we definitely have time for, for some. <clears throat> so let's have a look here. Um, I'll just publish them as I go and um, Patricia, maybe I'll ask you if a question comes up relevant to you. But the first question is just from um, MJ. Will you be sharing a copy of the presentation? So we'll actually be sharing a recording of uh, the presentation. Um, so you'll get a link to our YouTube page uh, with that so you can look back and see what we talked about. Um, we also have a second question here, um, and this is for you, Patricia. So let me just read it. Um, did Camrose look to other neighboring municipalities or counties as potential partners on this process? 
Although infrastructure has borders, we know that climate change does not stop at administrative borders. What opportunities exist in this space? Do you want to try and answer that one? Yeah, you bet. So because we were very heavily involved in the infrastructure side of it, and we, for our own owned assets, we didn't look to partner on this initial stage. I think uh, rolling out of the actions that are going to be in the summary and recommendations um, report, I think we're going to see some actions that are going to um, spur those community building um, beyond the actual lines of the municipality um, into some collaborative efforts on a, a variety of different things, I think, especially around vulnerable populations. But yeah, point taken, um, definitely uh, the actions that we take are going to need to go beyond our own municipality. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a good way of framing it. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, there's not you know, one right solution. Um, so just starting somewhere is, is helpful. And, you know, if action items point to let's look at this at a bigger scale, um, that's valuable too. So um, I guess we'll see what comes, but great question and um, good framing for kind of how to think about climate change in the context of you know, local government. And I think to just to add on to that, um, our report is really looking at the actions we can take to support our own infrastructure. And it's not looking at the um, climate impact reduction side of it. That would be a different project. And I think probably one that also would be supported under this planning stream. Um, but our, our lens is through the infrastructure risk reduction side rather than the climate the actual impact on climate reduction side that I know that the city of Edmonton is currently undertaking. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, again, a good comment. Uh, I mean, we talk about climate change kind of in, in two different ways that resiliency or adaptation side. There's, of course, the emission reduction side of it, and they're, yeah. they're connected for sure. Um, actions will have an impact on both. Um, just, I guess, in the program, we do have to differentiate how that works, but um, it, it's a good framing to think about both at the same time. Um, there's a question here, Patricia, um, and maybe this is just a follow up uh, outside of the webinar, but um, the question is, would cameras be willing to share their RFP? Yeah, you bet we can share that. So yeah, maybe if you, uh, it's an so, anonymous question, but if you, if you are that person, maybe just reach out. You can email me and I can pass the contact info along um, if that works. And I'm, I'm happy to share my email address. Uh, it's just my name, which isn't easy to spell, but it's P-M-A-C-Q-U-A-R-R-I-E at cameras.ca. Perfect, okay, so you have it there, but if you, if you whatever reason can't get hold of, for sure you can let me know. All right, um, there is another question here, I think uh, more specific to the tool. So let's hit publish and read it out. Is there a description on what the different criteria in the tool means and what levels look like for a municipality? For instance, items like progress on objectives. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, from my point of view, at least, um, uh, it was left intentionally open. Um, the idea being that um, progress is very unique for different communities. Um, you know, we have the city of Camrose here as a larger municipality. I think they measure progress in a way that's different than, let's say, like a summer village would. Um, not saying one is right, but I, I guess uh, it's left intentionally open for you to define. So, you know, progress might measure up differently. Um, if you did want to try and you know, get a bit of guidance on that. I would point you back to the framework. Um, like I mentioned, each of the specific competencies is detailed a bit more uh, there, and you can do that deep dive and try to understand, you know, what progress looks like. But um, hopefully, you know, if it feels like you're progressing um, in a way that makes sense to you, I would say that that's an effective measure. Any comments on how you would gauge uh, progress, Patricia, or does that kind of feel okay? Um, <laughs> it's a yeah. hard question. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I think for us, like we're really, just because we're at the, the planning stage of this, it's, I mean, I think our progress is gonna be measured by having a strong asset management component that's examining those climate resiliency actions along the way. Um, 
yeah, it, it's it's hard for me to anticipate at this point. Yeah, for sure. I think that kind of ties to the idea of, you know, um, measuring progress is so specific uh, to each case. So um, fair enough. I mean, absolutely having a list of actions that are coming out of the summary report is enormous progress over where we've been. Mm -hmm. And then being able to action those internally is going to be, you know, a, a, an ongoing multi-year plan. Yeah, for sure. Um, OK, a couple more questions here. Um, this one's pretty open ended, so uh, maybe I can take a stab at it first. And if you have a comment um, in the context of cameras, feel free to, to pitch in. But um, so hit publish, go over and read it. To be successful, this work must have support across the organization. Do you have tools for garnering the support of council, senior admin and other departments? So that's a great question. Great sort of uh, understanding of how, you know, this kind of work um, can have barriers um, if it's coming from a very bottom up process. Um, in, in this program, there are a couple tools framed around like just general education, and that might help with awareness uh, of why this might be a priority. This webinar is an example. Um, so, you know, hopefully, if we had you know someone that was in the decision making process attend the webinar or watch the recording, they might see value in this work. Um, we also do a bit of networking, like I should mention the community of practice. Um, that might point to, you know, other people are doing this work. Maybe we should consider it as well. Um, I think that's kind of the extent to which kind of we develop tools in the program. Um, if you if you have specific things that you might need, you're welcome to reach out and that either we can support or maybe we can help frame future work around as well. But yeah, that's always tricky. I don't know if there's you know, how that applies to cameras at all, if it does. Yeah, so for us, um, we started this whole process by going and getting the support of the council on this application. So even though it's not a component of the application, we did feel it was important to get their support on it. Um, and then part of the contract we have with our contractor is building that educational capacity in the organization around climate resiliency and climate change. So um, our top, basically our whole leadership team, it was close to our whole leadership team, um, was part of the first workshop that was really just climate change 101, what's the science and kind of that onboarding first step to, to get the involvement and the understanding from all of these uh, different um, employees around why this program is important. And then also the ability to tie it into our overall asset management program, which is one of council's strategic priorities. Uh, really helps frame it inside of the requirement of that asset management categorization. So um, we had a couple different touch points to tie it all together, but I think um, the way we've undergone this specific project in having uh, the staff have quite a heavy involvement is time consuming for them and it's asking a lot of them, um, but hopefully through that process that's actually going to build stronger um, buy-in in the end when it comes to implementing the actions as well. Yeah, that's that's a great kind of uh, a great point because you, you could just have a contractor come in, you know, do the work in their bubble and then give you a report and then leave. But part of capacity building is, you know, equipping those skills across the organization. So, you know, if you're able to get your project started and then involving other people is a great way of kind of building support. But uh, of course, I think maybe a barrier can exist for actually getting started in the first place. Yeah. All right, there's another question here about the program itself. Does the capacity building program support updating previous climate change adaptation plan? Ours was created in 2014 and is very high level, so it could use some updating with new trends and information. So to generally answer the question, yes, you know, if you have an existing plan, um, you're, you're welcome to apply. What I would look for in the expression of interest in the application is basically justification. So if it's saying, you know, it's been a long time since the plan has been written, um, we think it's out of date, that, that would, would, might work. Um, if it's saying that the process that we use perhaps is you know not as up to date with the current uh, way of looking at things that could work um, this will vary from case to case but there is the opportunity to kind of um, pr present that and um, if this is your question i'd welcome you to submit an eoi and we can have that conversation a bit more detailed on um, an update and, and the need for an update and can i just say that i think it's um 
it's important to take advantage of Ronick. <laughs> <laughs> For the city of cameras, I think, I don't know, we went back and forth quite a few times on trying to figure out the best way to formulate what we were trying to do. So uh, the advice and leadership from the MCCAC was certainly valuable in how we formulated that process. So I really encourage everyone on the call to just reach out to him um, to help talk through what you're thinking of doing. Don't don't think that that initial conversation, you need to have the answers and, and that's kind of your first green light. It's really an opening conversation to lead you through what your options are related to this program. Yeah, thanks Patricia. I, I, I guess what I would say like, it's not my job to like recommend what you should do, but I, I guess I, I can say what you can't do or what at least you yeah. can't <laughs> receive grant proceeds for, so. Um, yeah, please feel free to reach out. Um, so my contact info is up on on the page here. Um, there's also some key summary points. Um, we're out of time, so I won't cover them, but um, I, I think just kind of the first two are specific to um, the bulk of what we talked about. So use the self-assessment tool that might help point you in the right direction. And then I think one of my biggest takeaways from the Camrose um, project, or at least what Patricia has presented so far, is that um, there's value in integrating this work into you know existing uh, um, processes or priorities. So um, maybe consider that and that might help frame your project too. Um, but yeah, with that, um, I don't see any more questions in the queue. If you do have a follow up, you can always reach out to me. Um, but I just wanted to thank first Patricia for coming and attending and um, doing the live demo and, and talking about your project. I think it was really exciting to kind of hear what's going on and I look forward to seeing what happens with your project. Thank you. And yeah, thanks for everyone who was able to attend. Um, hopefully we'll see you in uh, an next webinar coming up soon. Thanks all.